Hello, my name is Peter Gowen. I'm going to be showing you images that deal with photography, re-photography, and history. By way of further introduction, I'd like to introduce you to Tracing the Line, my limited edition artist book that documented the landscapes of the Mexican-American border. More than 50 photographs, black and white photographs, were embedded in this book, and it was published in accordance with the principles and standards and aesthetic guidelines of 19th century survey photographers, and these books are now residing in major repositories across the United States. I also worked collaborating with the photographers in the Water in the West project, and I'm the first photographer who was given access to the Nevada test site, making photographs of this landscape, and that landscape has been subsequently opened to more than 150 artists who've made their own separate, unique interpretations of this rather dramatic landscape. This is a photograph from that book. It is Ground Zero. It is the dawn of the nuclear age in the Jornada del Muerto desert, and it is high noon at ground zero. I worked collaboratively with a number of other individuals uh, dealing with atomic culture. I did a reverse re-photography project. Uh, basically what I did there was where I made photographs that seemed to appear of interest that uh, were reminiscent of images in the nuclear age and then went back and found the original historic image. I also worked uh, with uh, two other uh, artists, a writer and another photographer on a doubtful river, which was Audubon's description of Nevada in the 19th century as a doubtful country. Human Nature is my serious and important project dealing with the reinterpretation of nature and with our efforts to recontextualize nature within the context of an architectural built environment. In other words, nature is a cultural concept an idea that is exportable. Here's an example of a photograph in that project, numbered trees. This is in the Duke Forest, and it's in this forest that they're testing transgenic material. This is a swamp uh, and a drain in a swamp. Actually, it's not there all the time. This is during a cleaning period, which happened periodically throughout the year, and I was there to uh, provide evidence of this drain so that you could see that it's not a natural landscape, but one that's created for our own educational enjoyment. Worked with Elizabeth Raymond on a book called Changing Minds in America, pun intended, and here we looked at post-mining landscapes, uh, restoration, and the efforts by these companies to recreate natural landscapes within the context of historic mining. An example of this is the Earth Angel Athritic uh, Radon Gas Mine. The point here is that people now enter into the mines, submerge themselves, irradiate themselves with radon, and presumptively address a variety of images from arthritis to other ailments. And uh, there's a prescribed uh, dosage and effort. And of course, this is highly controversial. But it is interesting that a mine site that originally was used to extract, extract uranium is now used in the context, correctly or incorrectly, but as a health mine. This is a photograph from a movie set, and it starred Arnold Schwarzenegger, and it's, uh, um, it comes from a mining site uh, in California, and it was a site that was uh, amended to look more post-apocalyptic by the movie crew. Also worked with a variety of different authors on Atlas of the Noon West, uh, and this was published by Norton. The idea of this project was really to look at and reconsider the West beyond the historical imperative of the conquest. One example is that we, of course, no longer use the term Anasazi. We use ancient Puebloans, but that the signage and, and imagery of ancient peoples are recontextualized within a commercial context as a sign of establishing identity of that ancestral heritage as if we were all in search of our roots, even if they're not our own. This particular project, Duby Lane, was in collaboration with the poet Gary Snyder and was done by an advanced class of photography students where we worked in the field to document this project. And this project is now underway in, ter in terms of becoming a, uh, a trade publication by Counterpoint Press and it'll be released in the fall of 2016. A more expansive study of this particular site, it's a very interesting outsider art location. Here's an example of some of the text. It's poetry and rocks. With Paul F. Stars, I co-authored the book 
Black Rock, and this reinterprets this very, very important desert region in northern Nevada. It is one of the top deserts in the world, and it is the site of the Burning Man Festival. A lot of these photographs predate the festival, and the project uh, ultimately resulted in an archive of work that is uh, preserved in a variety of different museums and other institutions. To give you an example of the kind of work and, and the historical information that's used in this, here you have Edward Hopper's Nighthawks, and it was a direct influence of my view of the Shell Station uh, at uh, Angerlach, uh, to give you an idea of just how uh, the history of art introduces or influences my interpretation of these natural landscapes. This is Moonrise over Black Rock. This is the Fly Geyser. And this is one of the earliest uh, fine art photographs produced, and it's resulted in literally hundreds of artists and photographers seeking to uh, go to the site to uh, make images uh, that celebrate this spectacular, beautiful site. I worked on Nevada rock art documenting a few of the 22,000 uh, sites in, in Nevada. This is a testimony to the creative work of our ancestors, and I use that term inclusively, that those people who lived here thousands of years ago had an expression of creativity, uh, dedication, and tenacity to produce such spectacular carvings on these rocks. This is a pictorial narrative, and it is a limited edition collector's book. This is a montage of, a, of, an examples, uh, of a few examples uh, from that project. If you notice the lizard, notice how it evolves into that space. Notice the cowboy, how it evolves into petroglyph, re re revising and changing the concept of how contemporary petroglyphs are still being made. Co-authored with Lucy Lepard time and time again, it was history, re-photography, and preservation in the Chaco world, a very interesting project of re-photography, really investigating how we recontextualize ruins, how we define a ruin, how we define those objects of our ancestral uh, residue, the artifacts of our culture, of previous cultures, and how we begin to change and modify them to suit our particular interpretive needs. This particular image was a damaged glass plate uh, with our contemporary technologies. We're able to restore it to the point where you're able to see uh, the full image. The railroad tracks in the foreground were used to extract artifacts. The contemporary re-photographs are not exact uh, replicas of the prior images, in part because these are standard images made with 4x5 technology so that in the future, should someone wish to re-photograph these sites, they will have suitable um, parameters by which they could uh, easily duplicate the image. What's interesting about this particular image, if you look at the doorway to the left and the reconstruction of this photograph, it was converted into a window. The idea being that the National Park Service wanted to transform the passages of tourists at the time. It's been much more restricted now, of course, but at the time, the structure was modified to change the direction of people walking through the space. Of course, sitting on the balcony would no longer be allowed, uh, but we do uh, populate these with, uh, with tourist sites and with guided tours and it's very, very rare to be given an opportunity to photograph the site uh, without anybody there. Uh, so here's a, a rare view of the site of, that you can see without anybody else in it. Such an amazing pile of rocks. Who would ever know, just from the layman's point of view, that this is the consequence? What I want to do now is, is visit Lake Tahoe. Uh, this is the cover of the book, Stopping Time, and on the top image, you have uh, the historic photograph of the state line, and then down below, you have the historic re-photograph. This is an image of Glenbrook. The historic image shows the industry of logging as an active concern, and of course, logging denuded the landscape considerably, and you can see that the foreground lake level looks to shift dramatically, but that is simply sawdust in the foreground and historical images that changes how much the lake appears to be 
uh, full or not. Here's a state line view, as I mentioned earlier, and here's the contemporary review. Yes, I'm standing in the middle of traffic. This is near Glenbrook, and this is uh, the extractive industry built for moving firewood out of the area on a zigzag, zigzag pattern, uh, bringing the train and the wood up the hill. What's interesting about these two pairs of photographs is that both days, obviously, the landscape was heavily, heavily clouded by smoke. In this case, in the contemporary view, the smoke is from fires in the distance. Cave Rock and a car to establish scale. This is the road around Cave Rock, and this is the contemporary view where the original view no longer existed. What's interesting about this particular Putnam and Valentine image is that it shows the car and a uh, woman, presumably, sitting in the passenger seat. She's there for scale, not for identity. Uh, she's there to indicate there's some effort to establish a documentary sensibility in the recording of this particular scene. This is not Lake Tahoe. This is Donner Lake. If you look at the foreground of this particular photograph, you'll see the car and the woman from the prior Putnam and Valentine image. Again, the car establishes a sense of scale. If you look at the contemporary photograph, on the left side of the photograph towards the center, you see the scar, which is Highway 80. And if you look at the bottom, you can see the remnants of the road. I also work with the Images of America series, and I've published uh, three books. The first one that I'm going to speak about is called Lake Tahoe. This is a collection of images that are used to document and reflect the historical narrative of these sites. By publishing in these series, I'm able to preserve these photographs that sometimes might be lost, and also to publish these books, I'm able to create an environment where people might contact me with additional caption information, correct historical information, generally establishing a conversation with the community and public at large. This particular photograph is part of a car rally. It's a very interesting series, a photograph from a series of images and a very arduous uh, travel, and you can see the roped snow tires. If you look at the amount of snow and the posing strategies, another th element that I'm very interested in recording and, and commenting upon is how people pose and uh, record their uh, passage through history and through time. This is a, a supply train, and it's uh, providing uh, sustenance, foods, materials, etc., for the uh, people working during the, the period of extractive industry, logging principally, some mining, some fisheries in the Tahoe Basin. Essentially, the Lake Tahoe B uh, Basin evolved into a tourist economy, and you have the train at Tahoe City uh, that delivered passengers from Truckee uh, entering onto the Tahoe, one of the major steamers owned by the Bliss family on Lake Tahoe. Well, uh, all kinds of posing strategies. This particular image is quite fascinating because it looks like she went out with that oar and slapped that fish. Uh, but these kinds of images do document our sense of what's important and how we wish to be preserved and what our references might be. Obviously, Maryland is referencing Marilyn Monroe. If you look at this July 1952 photograph at Mount Rose at the summit, that's quite a bit of snow. We haven't had snow like that in quite a long time, but it does tell you about the spectacle of the environment in the Tahoe Basin. The second book that I'm mentioning is Lake Tahoe Maritime History, uh, and this is a, a very interesting project that deals with the uh, importance of the living museum of Lake Tahoe uh, with these uh, wooden boats called woodies, with the steamers that are uh, memorialized, and it's a very serious project. What you're looking at here, however, is a series of, of maps that deal with where I've been making a lot of these photographs for this particular project and for the whole entire uh, reef photography section of the Lake Tahoe Basin. Uh, it's coded, and you can see uh, how many photographs were made, the frequency of the photographs, and the error of those photographs. Quite a lot of images made, obviously, in particular tourist areas, and so the history of the lake is also predetermined in part by those vid visitors and where they determine and decide to make photographs. It tells you where people felt that the landscape had meaning to them. The last Arcadia book is uh, Then and Now, South Lake Tahoe. And in this project, what I do is I take the historical photographs, as you see in this image, and I try to line them up and uh, do so in such a way that 
you're able to take a scene such as this, which is the construction of this very narrow highway, and then rephotograph it and uh, as close as possible, but in such a way that it uh, does give evidence of landscape change and how the transformation of the landscape reveals that the Tahoe Basin is defined as real estate and architecture, not just nature. Another view of state line. Gaming was legalized in Nevada in 1931, and that transformed the landscape into this postmodern concept of entertainment and recreation. This is Mount Talak, this historical photograph that was rephotographed in my project in uh, Stopping Time, one of my earliest books on Lake Tahoe, and then rephotographed again. What it does, it shows you the transformation of that landscape and then also the significance of, of uh, Mount Talak as a signifier of the alpine landscape. Looking at the architectural elements around the lake, if you look at the left at the chimney stack, you'll notice that that's all that essentially was preserved of that site. And there's this effort to reconstruct and recreate the landscapes in the Tahoe Basin and the architecture in such a way as to reflect the sentiments of wilderness and the alpine experience. Off in the distance in this photograph of the beach, you'll see state line, you'll see the casinos, but here's an earlier image and then the contemporary rephotograph, which of course shows a greater development uh, feature in the distance, but also shows a different element, different style of recreating, different kinds of people on two chosen days. The airport at South Lake Tahoe, uh, this actually is not the main airport as one might imagine. This is actually on, near the meadows. Uh, on the uh, lakeshore side of Lake Tahoe. If you look at this uh, pier and building with Talak on it, you'll notice in the rephotograph that it disappears. The transformation of these landscapes is quite interesting, and history resides not just in the absence of the view, but in the piers, in the sightings, in the artifacts that are under the water, and of course in the historic record. Photography predates scientific inquiry at Lake Tahoe by more than 60 years, therefore indicating that photography's role in the history of Lake Tahoe is essential. Notice the rock in the left foreground. Notice how the landscape has been transformed. Notice the pier that doesn't exist, but only the remnants to the right. Now in this uh, photograph of Speedboat rides, you'll notice that someone is very inappropriate in the way that they're riding that speedboat. A little showmanship going on there, but the pier looks like it's moved. Well, in fact, it has due to a fire, uh, and uh, the only indicator of this particular photograph in its accuracy is the landscape to the far left. Alpine experience is also indicated by the uh, residences and, and resorts, and uh, this is at Echo Bay, and you'll see a transformation of a recreational landscape into a really multi-million dollar business. Notice that the tree is still there. In this photograph, it's important to pay attention to the mountain peak and notice how the foreground landscape has changed. Emerald Bay in the foreground and the cars indicate the age of the photograph and the work done by the Works Progress Administration in building the road, and you'll notice that the road is still there. The landscape has, of course, been transformed. This is a, a photograph made clearly uh, within the modern contemporary era, and there's someone observing the view, indicating the importance of the view, the gaze, the sense of the visual uh, shed, if you will. If we talk about watersheds, think about view sheds. Here's the establishment of a view shed defined by this photograph and now obstructed by the growth of trees, which is a characteristic throughout the Tahoe Basin. This is still in Emerald Bay. You can see Finette Island to the left without the tea house, uh, Dick Barter's presumed grave site on the top of that mountain, and you have Preacher's Rock just to the right. Um, one of my uh, assistants is holding the bush down so you can still see Preacher's Rock, which would have otherwise been obscured. And you can see Finette Island, and you can see the mudslide that happened in 1955 on Christmas Day, transforming the landscape once again. 
Emerald Bay. We came across this uh, biplane photograph of Lake Tahoe, and I was able to get access uh, via the governor's pilot to an experimental uh, plane that was giving us the opportunity to make a re-photograph. Obviously, a little difficult to do from exactly the same site, but certainly from the same area. Here's a photograph of the plane. This is Emu Bay, shows the mudslide, Finot Island in the center, quite a dramatic view, one of the most photographed places in the United States. This historic view of the Tahoe Keys reveals the start of an amazing process of the transformation of a very important habitat from a cleaning, riparian environment to one of industry and of real estate. In this Tahoe Paradise historical photograph, notice the peak in the distance. It's the only reference that's available for re-photography. These environments are very difficult to re-photograph. It's a tremendous uh, practical and strategic uh, problem uh, and involves hours, if not weeks, of effort to try to find the exact location of these particular views. One of the other areas of emphasis of this pro project is the shoreline survey of 1915-1916. The photographs made in that survey were used by the courts to evaluate and determine the uh, status of legal cases dealing with uh, the appropriation of land upon the building of the dam at Tahoe City. These photographs provide a very interesting uh, recontextualization as the photographs are now used to evaluate shoreline conditions. The historic team uh, has placards with the altitude of the lake level in feet. And the historic photograph, take a look to the upper far right-hand corner. Notice that tree and notice that it still exists in, in the contemporary view. We rarely use trees as indicators of exact landscape position because it's very easy to be fooled by that. Uh, this shows a, a greater sense of that broader landscape and uh, shows you how we identify the landscapes with these broader views. This is a rock in Emerald Bay, uh, and it's awfully difficult to tell the scale or size of this rock, uh, hence we added two of our assistants on the top of the rock, notice the low water. The landscapes are transformed, although you can see vestiges of that historical information along the shoreline. People want peers. It's one of the great indicators of wealth and access and privilege at Lake Tahoe. The shorelines are transformed. One of the discoveries that we made, and it's visually obvious at this stage, is the amount of change involved in the shoreline and how it may appear to be the same or natural or exist in a wilderness state. The fact is it's been human managed and transformed in a variety of different ways and varies from high to low water. And this is a photograph that was made after a period of prolonged drought in the Tahoe Basin. Focus not on the individuals holding the placards, but on the landscape behind. And you'll see that we are in the same spot. The pier has been removed. The landscape has become a marina. We're also trying to find the oldest known photograph taken at Lake Tahoe so far from the stereo view of Emerald Bay. And this is one half of that view. Uh, and included in this view is not just the dog, but also uh, Dick Barter, who is the groundsman, the caretaker for Ben Holiday. One of the other important elements about this particular project is our methodology. Uh, it's much more complicated than it may appear. A lot of times what we're able to do is to find evidence of the old piers uh, by looking underwater and finding their location, as this pair of photographs indicates. We have to use the horizon. In many cases, we may be off 50 meters, 50 feet, one way or another. But the fact of the matter is, is that we're trying to get as close as possible so that we're able to make a determination of landscape change and make an assessment over the evolution of the landscape in the Tahoe Basin. 
Obviously, these photographs were made for different reasons. We are recontextualizing them in this study of how the landscape changes, how it's evolved, how it's used, and how it's interpreted. This canoe shows low water. Uh, we're even lower today. This is uh, Heyman's Landing and Roe Bay, uh, and you'll notice how the landscape has, in many ways, reverted back to the presumptive natural state uh, and without close examination, it appears as if it's always been that way. Now, this is a view from Echo Peak. The historical photograph was in 1925, and it also indicates evidence of fire burn along the Angora Ridge. Sand Harbor. Uh, this photograph is uh, myself and two of my team members were looking at a historic photograph and trying to line it up so that we're able to create a more closely related historical view from the original photograph. This is the original photograph, and this is the recontextualized view today. Many times in this process, we're simply looking for rocks, and the rocks oftentimes move, or the lake levels change the appearance of the rocks, or the position in relationship to the rocks makes the view unrecognizable. One of the subsets in our project beyond the shoreline survey is our work with the Angora fire. Now, this is a photograph of the historic um, fire itself. Well, this is not one of ours, but it is a historic photograph and shows the range of that photograph. It was in uh, 2007. Uh, it was uh, uh, quite a, an impact on the Tahoe Basin. And uh, if you look at an aerial view, uh, you can see that we've marked out the fire uh, range and zone showing the impact in scale. Uh, to the far left, you see the Tahoe Keys, and you see Emerald Bay to the top to the right, and you'll see Cascade and Fallen Leaf Lake above Angora Lake in the view of the photograph, and you see the Tahoe Airport at the bottom. What we did is we chose uh, uh, 10 sites throughout this region from the ridge down into the fire burn areas, and then we re-photographed these sites uh, over time. We're now in year 8, uh, concluding year 7, uh, and we're uh, showing a consistent landscape change that can be time uh, generated so that it can become a video of landscape change in this fire region. Hopefully this uh, visual transformation of the landscape over a 10-year period, which is our minimum goal, will be used to reveal evidence of landscape patterns, how we're responding to the landscape, and provide interesting and valuable uh, data for those individuals uh, attempting to manage the basin in more effective ways. It's a historic photograph of an Angora burn region. Many people do not realize that the Angora region has burned before. These are a series of photographs, uh, individual images within the context of the fire burn and the location uh, marked by the uh, bee-like yellow, black, ribbed, feather-like a structure with an orange cap. Uh, this is the source of the fire. Uh, these are a series of, of my team at work uh, looking at the photographs, re-photographing. Um, part of the point of this project is to engage students so that they can learn re-photography and learn field work, learn that photography exists more than just a means of creative expression. That is, of course, sufficient unto itself, but that this process gives um, young people, uh, students in our program, an opportunity to look beyond just the use of the photograph to record, say, themselves or uh, the beautiful landscape and transform their relationship to the medium in profound ways. We oftentimes have students do a lot of the re-photography so that they can gain that precision, so they can gain that sense of how to evaluate a landscape and how to gain cognitive abilities and our awareness of the transformation of the landscape. I chose the 10 sites, and part of the reason I chose those is much more complex, but part of it was anticipating certain kinds of change. And you can see that now, with the expansion of the homes in those particular sites, they're beginning to take over our re-photography sites, such that our cameras are now right up against a wall, or in some way requ require us to change the nature of the way we're thinking about the particular view. Again, our team members at work. This is frequented uh, usually once a month. The patterns vary, depends on landscape change, less so in the winter. Uh, this is one of our sites, and there's a series of photographs that are used to demonstrate how the landscape changes over time. This series of photographs covers seven years. 
The variations, subtle as they may be, deal with slight differences in how students line up the horizon in the background. When the photographs are assembled, uh, you'll realize that just a little bit of difference, or they're not using exactly the correct focal length of the lens. Uh, and while those may be minimal, those are, account for that variation. This is the end of the day. This is what we do when we conclude. We usually have field camps and uh, people um, try to have some fun. They participate, they narrate, and then of course they fall asleep. Our camp is a changing environment and as you look at the camp and as the people going through the camp, what's interesting about it is that we're doing this to record it because it seems important but then when we find historical photographs, we realize that we're not so far off and how other people may have experienced the same landscapes if in a slightly different position. Thank you.